It's all about Jesus, isn't it? Stand with me. So good to have you here this morning. We're starting a new series, our Christmas series called Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, listen, I was just really in the Christmas mood when they were singing. Wasn't that great? Listen, if the preacher never gets as good as the singing, we're going to go somewhere around here. Well, let's uh, pray and let, let's get into really the heart of Christmas this morning. Father, we're so grateful that you love us, you care for us, and Lord, today we magnify you and we want your word to go into our hearts and our lives and teach us and inspire us, and we ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here today. I'm fortunate to have my son Matthew over here to my left with us today, but when he was growing up, he, he kind of liked these one-liners, these jokes. How many of you ever heard of a one-liner? And one of his favorites was, uh, Dad, do you know why some people want to be pirates? And I'd say no, and he said, well, just because they are. <laughs> so I thought about that, and I, I, I said, well, let's see. You, you know what Adam says to Eve the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. <laughs> Why does everyone love Frosty the Snowman? Because he's so cool. And what does Frosty eat for breakfast? Frosted flakes and Ice Krispies. <laughs> this is a wealth of information for you today. <laughs> what do you get when you cross the snowman with a vampire? Frostbite, that's what you get. And the scariest reindeer of all are caribou. <laughs> and what do gingerbread men put on their beds? Cookie sheets. <laughs> Corny, right? Well, you know, Christmas is all about Christ, and we can get wrapped up in all the, the trappings and the things that are really not very biblical. But can we really have a wonderful Christmas with, without the wonder of Christmas and the truth of Christmas? And really the, the core of it should be the wonder and the truth of Christmas. You know, with all of the busyness and the shopping and the food and and all the presents and don't max out your credit cards. You know, it's, it's really commercialized today, and I'm not just knocking all of that, but let, let me rehearse a story I heard really years, years ago. It was actually in California. Yeah, California of all places. And uh, it was a group of kids leaving school, and they were going home after school. Well, on their way home from school, they passed by a church, and in front of the church was the Christmas nativity set. You know, you had the, the wise men and the shepherds and the animals and the manger, Mary, Joseph, and the baby. And, and one of the children, and this is a true story, asked, what is this? And another one said, I think it has something to do with Christmas. Isn't that how far we've come today? We, we've kind of lost the, the, the really core and the truth about Christmas. And sometimes this uh, guy in the red suit who is calorically challenged, who loves milk and cookies... And, and runs uh, with a different ride than you and I ride. Sometimes he gets top billing, but let me tell you, Jesus should get the top billing, right? And so you and I are here today to learn about that, and we need to uh, not get caught up in the, the trappings of that. And I guess not a lot of you know, harm in some of that. I think there is some good in it. You know, we can tell our kids, if you don't straighten up. Okay, some of you got that. But really, you know, the, the, keeping Christ at the core of Christmas and the center of Christmas and the central theme of Christmas, prophetically and theologically, should always be Jesus. I want to give you a passage this morning, if you have your Bible or look at it on the screen. 1 Peter chapter 1, and Peter's talking about our salvation. How many of you are so glad we have so great a salvation? And he's talking about that salvation and he says, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So they actually prophesied things they didn't understand. I mean, the Holy Spirit moved upon them. They spoke. And in that passage, Peter said the prophets actually searched the other prophets. You have to understand that all prophecy doesn't come through one person. It was many people. And they would get, begin to say, okay, this is that what that person prophesied, this person prophesied this. And, and what does all this mean? So who is coming? When he is coming? Why is he coming? I mean, what is coming? 
And all of that, we have a little clearer picture because we're on this side of that prophecy and we have the New Testament and we're on this side of Bethlehem. But yet, they really search for the meaning. So there is a paradox in prophecy. You say, okay, what does that mean? There's a paradox of prophecy. Well, let me just kind of share this with you because it says the spirit of Christ testified of the suffering Christ and the glory of Christ. And this is before Christ ever appeared. So the paradox of prophecy is how can he be a king and a servant at the same time? And so we have many verses. This is Genesis 49, 10. Jacob is blessing his children. And when he gets to Judah, he said, the scepter shall never depart from Judah. And a scepter is what a king has. And then later on, when Balaam is prophesying, and of course he's uh, you know, not a, a good person at the time, but yet when he sees Israel, he said, there is a king among them. And then later, the Spirit of the Lord would move upon David and share with David that your kingdom will never cease. There will be a descendant on your throne forever. There will be a king in your family forever. And obviously that's not talking about David because David has died and he's gone on. And then Daniel comes along and he says this, his dominion, talking about the Messiah, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And then again, Isaiah in 53, he comes along and he doesn't refer to him as a king. He calls him the righteous servant. And then he gives us a description of that righteous servant. He says, there's no splendor or comeliness that we should desire of him. He's despised and rejected of men and he's not even esteemed by man. So prophetically, the Bible says by Zechariah, he'll be sold for 30 pieces of silver, which is the price of a Hebrew servant. So here's the question, is he a king or is he a servant? You know, is he the lamb or is he the lion? Is he the root of David or is he the son of David? You know, those are all really kind of weird terms, isn't it? Is he the suffering one or is he the glorified one? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. So we understand that. But back then, they were trying to get a grip of that, and that's what Peter's writing about. So it is a, a paradox. So we know Jesus, when he came in Bethlehem, he is all those things and not just one of those things. But there's also a paradox of his nature and his essence. So the Bible talks about that. So is he to be human? And the answer is yes, because he has to be the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David to fulfill that prophecy. Uh, he is to be human because he is uh, the seed of the woman who's going to come and crush the head of the serpent. So all of this is what? Talking about his humanity. So in his humanity, he is going to do what? He's going to show affection. He's going to get angry. He's going to agonize. He's going to weep. He's going to feel pain. He's going to become weary. He's going to get tired. But also, I think if he's human, and he is, then he shows the other human qualities too. We don't think about this much. How many of you think Jesus smiled? How many of you think he laughed? Well, let me give you a verse. This is out of Luke, and, and this is when he's talking to his disciples. He says... Uh, that he is wanting them to rejoice because their names are written in heaven. And then the Bible says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. Well, the word rejoice means to be exceedingly happy and to leap for joy. Can you picture Jesus getting happy and leaping for joy? Well, you say, well, you know, is, is he really that human? Well, he is human. And this is what Ecclesiastes 3 says. You know this, there's a time to weep. And there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn. And there is a time to dance. And Jesus attended weddings. He attended banquets. He attended a lot of those things that the religious community did not attend. He attended so much that the religious community called him, listen, they called him a gluttonous person and a wine bibber because he didn't roll like they rolled. How many of you know Jesus rolled different than the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, because he was so much different? But yet, the Bible talks about his humanity. And in his humanity, that baby born in a manger is just a man. Well, he is a man, 
because he had to become a man. Now let me tell you why. Adam and Eve, they lost paradise in the garden. How would you like to re-roll time? Never age, never die. Okay, three of us would like to do that here. But they didn't. I mean, God put them in a perfect place. He formed him from the dust of the earth, the clay of the earth, Adam, which means red or ruddy. And uh, in Latin, we get this word homo, human, homo sapien. And, and then from his side, Eve's created. Everything's going fine. And, you know, I said in the first service today, uh, God said, okay, Eve, you got to like football. And Adam, you got to like Hallmark movies. Uh, and everything was fine until they sinned. But once they sinned, man lost that relationship with God. They lost their righteousness. They lost their holiness. They became sin-stained. And every person who was born after that, they were born in sin. And now, the second Adam, or the last Adam, the Bible calls Jesus, had to undo what man, Adam, got us into. Now, let me tell you something. A perfect person had to undo what a perfect person got us into. That's why he had to be human. And here's another reason. God said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. And he said, I'm going to give dominion over to them. So who had dominion over the earth? Adam did. Mankind did. So if man has dominion over the earth, a man had to come and take that dominion to undo what the first Adam did. How many of you are tracking with me here? So what I want you to do is really perk up your ears so that you can understand the real core truths about Christmas. How many of you know it's more than jingle bells? All right, you're with me. But a question that I have for you is that is that body in Bethlehem really human? I mean, is it of the elements of oxygen and nitrogen and carbon and potassium and calcium? Yes, because we were created what? From the dust of the earth. Human. Have you ever heard the term humus, which is talking about soul? So ladies, if you ever wanted to know if your husband was a dirt bag, the answer is absolutely true. <laughs> because we're all dirt bags. We were formed from the dust of the earth. So he is human. But here is the other side of it. He is also divine. He's also God. Now, how do we know that? Well, the Bible is just really uh, replete with those references. And this is what makes Jesus different from every other religious figure, every other leader in history. See, every other leader could not claim divinity, but Jesus did. Do you remember when Zacchaeus went up the tree to see Jesus? And we sang the song, Zacchaeus was, okay, stop right there. Was a wee little man, a wee little man was he? Climbed up the sycamore tree. So when Jesus called him down from the tree, and he said, today I'm going to go to your house. And when he went to his house, he said, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. Not is going to come to your house. Today salvation has come to your house. Jesus is salvation. He, he's not pointing you somewhere for salvation he's not directing you somewhere for salvation he's not the ambassador for salvation he is salvation and he is the only salvation so in his humanity yes he is human he's the son of man but in his deity he is the son of God he is God wrapped up in flesh and we have to understand that we have to believe that. See, if we don't believe that, we've gone off course biblically. So we have to come back to the core of the teaching of theology of Christmas that Jesus is both human and he is divine. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, you're going to hear this uh, every Christmas somewhere, that the Lord's going to give a sign. And he'll give you a sign, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, we know the virgin is Mary. We know the son is Jesus. I mean, we got that, don't we? But Isaiah goes on to say that his name shall be called what? Emmanuel. Say that with me. Emmanuel. Now, let's all set together. Here we go. Roar. Emmanuel. What does that mean? God 
with us. Not some God, not one of the gods, but God is with us. Now he goes on to say in chapter 9, look with me at, uh, uh, well, let me back up here. That passage is literally fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. Let me take you there. Uh, So all this was done, verse 22, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So when Mary had the baby in Bethlehem, she fulfilled Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. That prophecy was 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years. The Spirit of God moved on Isaiah to say this is going to happen, and it happened 700 years later. Then a virgin is going to give birth, and that virgin is going to conceive without the aid of a man. Mary, you're going to have the egg. The Holy Spirit is going to carry the sperm, going to carry that which is going to conceive the child within your womb. Now, please understand, the sin nature comes through the Father. Adam, our first father, everyone born after Adam carried that sin nature. All of us have that sin nature. But when Jesus was born, Joseph was not his natural father. The Holy Spirit planted the seed within the Virgin Mary, and she conceived. So if the curse comes through, then Jesus is without sin. Matter of fact, we know that. Bible tells us that. He is the perfect Lamb of God. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Listen, I can't take away your sins. I can't even take away my own sins. Look at your neighbor. They're messed up. They are. Your your neighbor's messed up. Let me tell you why. Because you're messed up. We're all messed up. That's what Brian says. We're all messed trying to get better. And that's true. But Jesus is born without sin. Now, One of the things that happens is because he had to come that way to fulfill Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent or Satan. Now, it didn't say the seed of the man. What did it say? The seed of the woman. So the seed of the woman is Jesus. He's the only one that was born of the virgin. Now, let me get a little bit deeper here. How many of you have ever heard of the term the immaculate conception? Okay. That has nothing to do with Jesus. Some of you know that. Matter of fact, that was brought into Catholic doctrine by uh, uh, one of the popes. His name was uh, Pope Pius IX. But let me read this to you. What is the Immaculate Conception? The Immaculate Conception is a Catholic dogma that states that Mary, whose conception was brought about the normal way, was conceived without original sin or stain. That's what Immaculate means, without stain. This is not talking about Jesus. They're saying that Mary was born Immaculate. How many of you know that's not in the Bible? That's why we should never pray to Mary or we don't go through Mary to get to Jesus. Let me tell you something. You today can boldly come to the throne of mercy and grace. You don't have to go through me. You don't have to go through Matt. You don't have to go through a priest. You can come to Jesus just the way you are. How many of you know that's just good news? That's just absolutely good news. We can come straight We can boldly come to the throne of mercy and grace. That's what the Bible says. But in that doctrine that Mary has no sin and God gave her grace not to have sin, that's why she became the Virgin Mary. Listen, Mary herself in Luke, have you ever heard the the term the magnificent or the song of Mary? Mary said, I rejoice in God my Savior. You know what she's saying? I need a Savior. Why does she need need a Savior? Because this is what the Bible says. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Say that with me. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we are all sinners by nature, but we're redeemed by Jesus. Why? Because he had no sin. He took your sin, and I took his righteousness. You took his righteousness. So 
we have in this entire Christmas story some very basic theological truths that we have to understand or it's all jingle bells. And it's all elves and reindeers. I'm not knocking that. There is some value in it. As I said, you can say be good or. Uh, and, and what we have to understand is we have to understand what the true core meaning of Christmas is. Can I hear an amen? So this is the miraculous conception. The miraculous conception. Because no one was ever conceived that way even though the birth might have seemed normal. Because she is conceived, he is conceived by the seed of the Holy Spirit. Without sin, pure, the image of God coming to mankind. So Jesus is not just a good man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a religious leader. My friends, listen, Jesus is God wrapped up in flesh. He's God wrapped up in flesh. Now, how do we know that? Well, when people go astray and they begin to say, well, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the historical Jesus. I, I believe he was a good man. He was a prophet. He was a healer. He's all those things, but how many of you know he is more than that? He is God in the flesh. So God in the Old Testament, he identified himself in a conversation with Moses, backside of the desert, burning bush. Moses asked a point blank question, God, who are you? And this is God's response. I am that I am. How many remember that? So Jesus comes along in the New Testament, and when he is dialoguing and debating some of the religious leaders, and they're saying, we're of our father Abraham, we're not for sure who your father is. You know what they're accusing him of? Illegitimacy. They're saying, there's a question about your birth. Let me, let me clear that up. There is a question about his birth. <laughs> he was not birthed by a natural father. Joseph was not his father. So they're saying, we're of our father Abraham. We're not for sure who your father is. Matter of fact, we think you're the fa your, your father's the devil. And he said, if you were Abraham's seed, you would believe me because Abraham rejoiced to see my day, salt was glad. And they laughed at him. They said, you're not even 50 years old, and you're telling us that you've seen our father Abraham. And listen, this is what he said. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And listen, they knew what he was saying. We, in our culture, we don't understand that. We're, we're not Jewish. We're not Hebrew. We weren't raised under the law. They knew the name of God. I am that I am. And Jesus goes all the way back to the burning bush. He takes the name, applies it to himself, and he says, I am. They picked up stones to kill him. You know why? If he is not who he says he is, he's committing blasphemy. But he doesn't just do it then. He says this. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection. I am the vine. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He just goes and goes and goes that I am. And he is just stirring up their, he's stirring up their anger every time he says it. Because what's he doing? He's taking the name of God over and over and over. He's applying it to himself. Listen. The Old Testament says Elohim created all things. This is Paul, what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1. By him all things were created. Talking about Jesus. Okay, wait. Okay, who created? Was it Elohim or was it Jesus? Yes. Was it Elohim or was it Jesus? Paul, you got your theology wrong because I read in Genesis, Elohim created everything, and you're saying by him, Jesus, all things were created by him and for him, and all things exist because of him. And then he writes later in chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Hebrews 1, 3. Jesus is the expressed image of God's person, Philip, John 14. He says, okay, you say you're going to the Father, show us the Father. And he said, Philip, have I been with you so long? You don't even know who I am? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. See, listen, here's the, here's the thing. Jesus is God in the flesh. And the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and here's the key word bodily, dwells in him. So is God omnipresent? Absolutely. Was that body omnipresent? No. But he is God shrouded in flesh. He has put on a tent of flesh, if you will, and he came to dwell among us. Now, this is what John 1.1 1, 1 says. In the beginning was the Word. 
The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that's not my words. That's what the Bible says. And he goes on to say, through him, all things were made. He came to his own. His own did not recognize him or receive him. He made the world. The world did not recognize him. He became flesh, dwelt among us, the only son whom came from the father full of grace and truth. Listen, there's only one son. There's only one God. God wrapped himself, veiled himself. He came to us. Why? We needed him. We had to have him. We could not get out of our mess without him. And neither can you. Neither can I. We had to have redemption. We had to have a savior. We had to have someone to come and rescue us. And that's why Jesus came. In the fullness of time, born of a virgin, under the law, he came to us. Now, this is what Isaiah 9, 6 says. So Isaiah talked about the virgin in chapter 7, chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who's Isaiah talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Now catch this. Unto us a child is born. Mary birthed the child, a boy child, a son. But it says, but unto us a son is given. Who gave the son? God did. You know what John 3.16 says, don't you? For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his only begotten son. The greatest Christmas gift we ever got was Jesus. The greatest Christmas gift you'll ever get is Jesus. Why? Because he is salvation. His name means God is salvation. His name, Emmanuel, means what? God is with us. And so here he's saying that this is the word of God. This is the expressed image of God. This is the person of God wrapped up in human flesh. And let me tell you something. And Jesus exhibited that all through his ministry. And that's why they wanted to kill him. Because he made himself divine or he made himself divinity. How many of you are glad that he alone stands alone in that category? There has been no one in history ever, ever that has ever come up to anywhere close to where Jesus is. Muhammad can't, Buddha can't, no one can. You, you know, I, uh, I, I've shared this with you some time ago and several times, and it's really a true story. A guy, very smart, very intellectual, that uh, I knew, and we were having breakfast, and he was an Egyptologist, and he was into Eastern religions. And uh, he, he knew I'm a, I'm a pastor of what I believe, and so he, he told this story. He, he said, Pastor Mike, some people believe there was a young rabbi who left Israel and went to the Far East and studied Buddha and came back and started a new religion. Guess who he's implying that that is? That's Jesus. So he said, there's this, uh, this rabbi who left the, the Middle East, went to the Far East, and he came back and he started a new religion. And I know where he's going. He's, he's gigging me. I haven't ever been gigged before. And he's gigging me. And so I listened to him in his explanation. And when he finished, his name was Jim. And I said, Jim, I said, if Buddha had been a contemporary of Jesus, he should have left the Far East and come to the Middle East and learn how to raise from the dead. How many of you know the conversation stopped at that point? <laughs> he said, well, that's interesting. I'd like to talk to you some more about it. I said, Jim, I'd love to visit with you about that. Jesus stands alone. I mean, listen, he absolutely stands alone. So when you and I come to Christmas, I'm not saying all the other things are, are bad. Listen, we're, we're going to do some of that ourselves. We got grandkids. How many of you know? Woohoo! <laughs> so we're, we're going to do some of that ourselves. But the core of Christmas... The prophetical thrust of Christmas, the theological truth of Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. And so that's what we have to keep at the core. That's what we have to keep in centrality over the holidays. And I don't know if Jesus was born on December the 25th or March 1st. I mean, and neither do you, matter of fact. But I know he was born. And I know who he was. And I know why he came. I know where he's at today. And I know he's coming back. 
And that's what we believe. And so in that, we have a firm foundation to take what we know and live our life on that truth. And guess what? If you really know that you know, I mean, you know that you know, and you've had that personal experience, I'm going to guarantee you nobody's going to talk you out of that. If you're wishy-washy, maybe. If you don't understand, could be. But if you know that you know, I'm going to tell you, they're, they're not going to fool you. Some of you know this. You know how federal agents know what's counterfeit and what is not counterfeit? And it's not because they, they study all counterfeit money. You know what they study the most? Real money. And if you study real money enough, when someone gives you the counterfeit, you know what? You can feel it. You can see it. You, you can smell it. You can taste it. And you know what you're going to say? That, that, that's not real. And when someone gives you a counterfeit religion or a counterfeit Messiah or a counterfeit Savior, you know what you know? This stinks. This is not, not, not the right thing. But I want to tell you, this Jesus that we're serving, this Jesus that we're adoring, this Jesus that we're celebrating at Christmas is the one true Messiah, the living God wrapped in flesh that came among us to do what he only could do, and that is to save his people from their sins. And that's what the Bible says. You know, th there's a lot of words we use at Christmas, you know, holly, and we, we use uh, uh, Mary and angels and joy and, and cheer and all kind of things. But I, I think today, maybe I could deposit this in your spirit. Maybe the word you need to leave with is Emmanuel. That if you leave with that word, you know what you're saying? Hey, God's with us. God's with us. And we don't have a high priest that doesn't connect with us. The Bible says we have a high priest that knows everything you go through. That's why he came. He dwelt among his people. He wanted to experience what you experience. So when you go to him, how many of you know he knows? He knows. He's felt that. He's felt the rejection, the pain, the storm, whatever it is. And whatever you do from this moment on, you will know you are never alone. You are never, ever alone. If you watch television, I'm amazed at how many medicines, pharmaceuticals, have been on the television that will keep you from depression and despondency, and then they give you that little tag at the bottom that it will create this, 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 and even death. Yeah, give me two of those. I'm not saying that some people aren't helped by that and they don't need that, but listen to what I'm saying. When you feel down, you feel depressed, you feel alone, I'm going to tell you you're never alone if you're a believer. Because Emmanuel means what? God is what? With us. Jesus said this, I will never leave you or forsake you. Not only is God with you, guess what? God is in you. He, he is in your life. He's in your heart. He's in your soul. And whatever you go through, guess what? He's going to go through that with you. He, he's going to step into that with you. So you are never, ever going to be alone if you're a believer because he is going to be right there with you. I heard this story many years ago. It was so impactful for me. It's very simple. It's in the middle of winter. It's dark. It's cold, blizzard. I mean, the snow's packed up, sub-zero weather, kind of like if you live in Kansas. But, but horrible weather. And the guy's looking out of his window, and there's a little flock of birds. And those birds are shivering. It looks like they're dying. They, they, you know, everything's covered up as food, and, 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 you know, there's just no shelter. And he's looking at those birds, and he tries to throw out some seed, and they won't come because they're scared. And, and this is what he finally said. He said, if I could be a bird, I would go to the flock of birds and say, listen, birds, Follow me. I'll show you where the food is, and I'll show you where the shelter is. And you know what God did? He became a man, and he said, listen, follow me, and I'll show you where the food is, and I'll show you where the shelter is. I'll show you where you need to go. I'll, I'll show you how you need to live. I'll show you the way to heaven because I'm not just talking about salvation. I am salvation. 
Jesus didn't say believe on this or believe on that or believe on this over here. You know what he said? Believe on me. And guess what? Today, we believe on him, don't we? He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Young people, let me tell you, when, when you're at college and mom and dad's not there and you don't have enough for a McDonald's hamburger, has any other elders been here like that? Or you don't have enough, well, it's changed now, you don't have enough money to go through the toll gate, you had to go around the other way? Or you had to explain to the lady to say, I'm sorry, I'm here, I forgot, I don't have any money? Whatever the situation is, Emmanuel, God is with you and you may be here today and say pastor it's my marriage i don't know about it it could be my finances a job my health i want to say something to you god's with you god's with you he said pastor if you and carrie ever been in a situation like that well hello <laughs> several several times and you know what we just kept trucking we kept believing we kept going forward because this is what we knew god was with us and if God's with you, you're going to get through this. Listen, I don't know who I'm talking about right now. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I sense in the Holy Spirit, I'm talking to someone who needed to hear right now, God's with you. I don't know what you're going through, but I want to tell you, God's with you right now. You're not going to go through this by yourself. If you will accept him and his help, he will help you through the darkest hours of your life. That's who he is. That's why the angel said to the shepherds, it's good tidings, good will toward me. It's peace. Why? Because the Savior came. God came to his own, his own creation. And God's come to you today. Would you bow your head with me? As we get ready to leave, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to know him. He's the only way for you to get to heaven. You can't be good enough, smart enough, rich enough, whatever. But Jesus is the way. Or maybe today you've kind of drifted away and you need to reconnect. You need to get back to where you need to be with God. If that's you, and I know it's going to take a little courage to do this, would you just lift your hand with mine and say, Pastor Mike, I just need to reconnect. I need to connect for the first time to the one who saves, and that's Jesus Christ. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. I don't want to miss anybody. If that's you, just lift your hands. all I'm asking you to do. Thank you. Let me ask one more question. Today you are here and you're saved, you've accepted Christ, and you're going to make heaven your home. But between now and heaven, this is what I know. There's trials, tribulations, sometimes there's issues we go through, and it can be very difficult. If you're going through something right now, it could be a marriage, it could be with uh, an addiction, it could be with finances or a job, or it could be with your children or grandchildren. If there's an issue that you would like God to intervene and help you with in your life, would you be so bold to lift your hand, and I'm going to be the first one that lifts their hand and say, Pastor Mike, I've got an issue in my life that I need Jesus to help me with. Several hands are going up right now. I have an issue in my life that I need Jesus to help me with. And here's the good news. This Jesus that we're preaching about is the one who said, I will be with you. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come up and stand across this front. Would you stand with me all over the house? Let's stand together. If you raise your hand for any reason, I want you to come up here. Someone will pray with you. You don't have to share everything if you don't want to, but I want you to come and stand right here. Let's give them a hand as they come right now. Come on, folks. There's my friend Jaden coming up for the first time right there. If there's an issue in your life that you'd like to pray for, we want to pray with you right now before we slip out of here. Listen, Emmanuel, God is with us today. 
I'm going to wait just for one minute. I don't want to miss anybody. When, I, when you leave through those doors and get in your car, I want you to know that you know that you know God's with you today. Come on, let's all pray. And if you would like to come and help us pray, I need about 40 or 50 people to come up and help us pray right now. Would you slip out? Would you gather around some of these folks right now? The rest of us will pray if you need to right from your seat. But you're welcome up here to pray. We're going to wait for you. Now, as they pray, let's pray together. Come on, let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we're praying that you would lead us and guide us. You would bless us with your presence. You would help us in our difficulties. God, you would walk through our lives with us, and you would never leave us, and you would never forsake us. God, forgive us of our sins. God, we receive you into our heart. Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Lord, be the one that I commit my life to, that I might make heaven. I repent, Lord, of my sins, my iniquities, my faults, my failures. And God, I ask you to come into my life and my heart forever and ever and ever. And Lord, bless each one that's come today. Touch their life. Touch their hearts. God, lift their spirits and let them know that they will never, ever be alone that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. I'll see you tonight at the concert, hopefully. Give the Lord a hand clap. Have a good rest of the day.